Welcome to the official Jets podcast. Eric Allen here inside the studio, joined by a special guest. Anytime Lavernius Coles comes to One Jets Drive, it is a good day. LC, great to see you. Uh, great. Thanks for having me, man. Hey, uh, so approaching the facility here, a lot different than Hofstra, huh? Uh, I mean, <laughs> night and day, man. I mean, just pulling in, you just get this. This feeling of just just greatness coming through the gates, and uh, you get to see this magnificent building Mr. Johnson has put together for these guys to come in and work at, and I mean just the atmosphere itself is just exhilarating. So you said the atmosphere itself is exhilarating. It, elaborate a little bit. Well, I mean just the energy from the the people and the guys, and even being at practice. I mean coming in the Hofstra, not no knock on Hofstra, it was what I knew, but. It was a bit different. You're turning into a university. You're pulling up to a big, dark gate. Uh, <laughs> you're coming into an old building. Guys have been in since probably the 60s. And then you come here in this new this state-of-the-art technology. Everybody has a smile on their face. The energy's in the building. Uh, everybody's excited about the guys that we have on the field. And it just feels like something great is brewing here. When you are watching the wide receiver drills like you did today, what are you eyeing up? Well, what I was looking at, just the depth that they have at their position, and I know that they're not going to be able to keep all of those guys, but it's just looking at the the decisions that our front office is going to have to make on who to keep, who to let go, and all of those guys, just by watching them work, I know they're going to end up on somebody else's team if we let them go. So me being a selfish person I am, <laughs> we may have to keep all of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Garrett Wilson, uh, number 10 overall selection out of Ohio State, and then Elijah Moore, was fantastic yesterday in joint practices. I mean, we're taping this after the second day of joint practices with the Atlanta Falcons. Um, what goes on in terms of a transition from the college ranks to the pro ranks? I, I would assume at this point that it's just getting the, the language and understanding the offense, uh, trying to get on the same page with the quarterback. Uh, they've had a quarterback injury now, so then you have to step up and try to get some work done with Flacco and try to get on the same page because every quarterback wants things done a little different. And then you're trying to please your coordinator, which is the most important person uh, that's going to actually get you your opportunities. So when, when I watch them and I see um, them trying to get in tune with what everybody's wanting them to do and then still trying to learn, they don't look like fish out of water right now. They look like they actually know what's going on. So for me, they've already taken the, the, the giant steps towards being good players and also being great players. So the, the, these guys have got nothing but greatness ahead of them. How advantageous is it to have a guy like Flacco, 37 years old, a former Super Bowl MVP, he's passed for 41,000 yards in his NFL career, still looks spry at 37. Uh, unfortunately, Zach Wilson goes down. Jets seem to have good luck there that it's not a major injury Correct. so at some point he's going to get back but while that happens the offense what we see it's operating at a crisp level well that's that's just veteran leadership and a guy that has experience when you have a guy that's that's, that's played on the biggest stage there is in a super bowl i don't think he's, he's gonna be rattled at all and then he's, he's prepared i mean he's a veteran he knows what to do he knows how to prepare for the games he knows how to get those guys in tune and then his leadership skills just 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 takes control and they know how to fall in line too the wide receivers are going to step in and just be themselves and as long as they keep him happy and the coordinator happy they have smooth selling. They're going to make the plays. The offensive line got to protect. Uh, the running back looked really good, number 20. And Brees Hall. Yeah, oh, I don't, I don't. I mean, he's, he's, he, he showed some brilliant flashes today and got me excited about him. So, I mean, the sky's, the sky's the limit. They have potential beyond my wildest <laughs> dreams. They're so much better than I thought they would be at this point since they're so young. Really? Yes. They surprised you out Su there, Surprised today. me. Really did. Okay, Brees Hall. You said brilliant flashes. Yes. What does he bring to the table? Catching the ball out of the backfield is one of the things I noticed. He has very soft hands. Um, then to see his, his, his put his foot in the ground and get north and south and accelerate really fast, uh, very impressive. I mean, I don't want to – Throw him out there like that, but he reminds me of Curtis a little bit once he plants and goes and just see him accelerate through the line really? and protecting the ball. So he's going to be special. Watch. Um, you're high on Brees Hall. The Jets – Totally transform the tight end room as well. How can, from a receiver's perspective, how can guys like Brees Hall, Michael Carter, C.J. Uzama, Tyler Conklin open up space for you guys on the outside? Well, I think in this in this instance, it's going to work in, re in reverse. Okay. These guys, because most of the attention is going to be paid to the guys on the outside because those are the guys that they know about. But – those guys in the middle of the tight ends have very soft hands also, and they was catching some balls today. So I think when people pay attention to the outside guys, it's going to open up the middle of the field and give Flacco and guys 
an opportunity to make those easy throws down the middle of the field so that they can make big plays. And then that's when they have to condense the field and, and take away the middle. Then it opens things up for the outside. How hard is it for young players in this situation coming to a team that hasn't been in the playoffs in 11 years, got a lot of talent because you walked into a situation in the National Football League. 2000, you guys didn't make the playoffs in 2000. Then a coaching change. But then you guys started making the playoffs on a regular basis. Well, I, I think it, at, at this time in their careers, you don't know any better. Okay. And so, so when I was younger, I thought we could win every football game. You just do. You just just truly believe, no matter what the paper says or what they say on TV, who they pick. I always left the locker room believing we were going to win. And so these guys, they don't know. Uh, how good they are, so they're going to go out and lay on the line every week because they know they have an opportunity to win a football game. And when you have that mindset, they've already got the game won. Do you like what you see out of Sala, Robert Sala, second-year head coach, always seems to be in control, very positive with his players? I mean, just his energy, just meeting him today, yeah. and how he commands the field and the guys and the way he interacts with people. I can tell he would be a guy we want to run through a wall for. And that is all you can ask for out of your head coach. If he can win his guys over to go out and play 110% on Sundays for him, they're going to win a lot of football games. Do you consider yourself the fifth ace of that 2000 class? Four <laughs> first-round picks, and then the Jets get Lavernius Coles out of Florida State in the third round? Well, I mean, we had we had a great draft class, and I mean, the the, the, the I'm thankful the Jets gave me an opportunity. I had an opportunity to send a message to Coach Parcell the other day for giving me a chance to even come in. But just being a part of that draft class, having four first-rounders, uh, and those guys play, I think, between them almost 50 years. Those guys have between them. They all had successful careers and did really well. And just to be a, a, a guy, basically I was a fly on the wall that nobody knew about coming out of college and, and getting myself in a little trouble. But to see those guys just do what they did and then to be a part of that and be Mitch, because we still had Windrow Hayes and uh, Tony Scott. And there was a lot of – I think we actually had 12 or 13 rookies make that team that year. So that was a lot of guys – uh, for, for one team, and we had a veteran team at the time. That was with Vinny Testaverde and Mo Lewis and Marvin Jones and yep. Marcus Coleman and Aaron Glenn, <laughs> Dwight Stone. I can go on and on. And just just the, the, the atmosphere and the team itself was great. And then to be a part of that class and then be remembered with that class, I can't ask for nothing better. That's fascinating that you reached out to Parcells the other day and thanked them. Yeah, had to. Oh, Just randomly? So – no, I spoke with Tannenbaum, and okay. I let him know that I wanted to reach out to him and, and tell him thank you for taking the chance on me. Because really, I, I, I don't think I was on anybody's board other than maybe um, the Jets and then Jacksonville. Because Jacksonville told me at that time they were going to take me at 21. They were going to take me or R.J. Soward at 21. After that, I had no clue where I was going to end up at. And for them to give me a chance in the third round, it, I mean, to this day, just him giving me a chance means the world to me. Looking back, you – you bring such positivity about you. You ever get mad about the way it was coming out of the draft? Like, you're in a situation where Peter Warwick gets yeah. treated completely different than a Lavernius yeah. Coles, and you get this tag that you're trouble. Yeah. Yeah. I get, I get Well, I mean, it, 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 I did play with a chip on my shoulder for a long time, and I was, and I was I'm, so to speak, I was angry at the world. I mean, I just I couldn't believe that. I think it was 17 guys that were better than me in that draft. And it, it, it gave me the, the 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 burn on the inside to go out and play hard and play with the toughness and want to show everybody that I wasn't what they thought I was going to be coming in. Like, I'm going to show you that I wasn't a risk and I'm not a thug and I'm going to go out and play hard and play through pain and play through injuries to stay on the field because these people gave me an opportunity. So just being thankful and gracious for it. But I still was a, a, a lot upset about it. Still to this day, I still can't believe they took 17 guys ahead of me. Yeah, <laughs> no, nobody else can either. Um, so 17 guys, that's something else. And that's something that you keep with you. Yeah. What I also wanted to ask you about 2000 is the Jets trade – Keyshawn Johnson yep. to Tampa Bay. Did you inherently feel a lot of pressure walking in that, I don't know, did you have to replace Keyshawn Johnson or did you have to make sure that the Jets made the right decision here? Well, originally, I think they, when they drafted uh, Wendrell Hayes, he was the guy that was going to play receiver. They drafted me to play uh, special teams is what coach called me. When they called me that night uh, after they drafted me, they was like, listen, <laughs> you're not here to replace Keyshawn Johnson. My mind, I'm like, I'm here to replace Keyshawn Johnson. But they were like, you're not here to replace Keyshawn Johnson. You're here to play special teams and help the team out. 
that was the mindset that Coach Numb told me to go into the New York media with and just say, hey, listen, I'm, I, whatever they ask me to do, I'm going to do it. I'm not here to replace Keyshawn. And Keyshawn was a star, still is a star. Right. So, I mean, <laughs> you didn't want to fall into that where just in case, you know, you, you set yourself up for failure, you're not able to live up to what Keyshawn had done before you got here. When did you feel like I'm breaking out right now? Uh I, I felt good. I, I remember we went down and played Tampa that, that year, and we all went out to dinner. And the guys kind of let me know what they felt about me at the time. And I didn't know where I stood with the guys. I mean, you're a rookie. And the guys was like – That's week four. Yeah. yeah. So they brought me into the – they went to the restaurant. Keyshawn was there, I guess. Uh, he, had, he took the guys out for dinner, and I was there. And Richie Anderson and somebody else came and said, come here. So they took me over there to Keyshawn, and they was like, hey, Key, this is who we got to replace you. I, I mean, I didn't say anything. And Key looked at them and, and pulled out. I'll never forget, he pulled out his black card and put it on the table and say, until he get one of these, he can't replace me. <laughs> but it was Key. Fashion, I mean, just, just Key being Key. Right. And it, it just motivated me. Like, man, these guys really think that highly of me to, to tell Key to his face that I'm going to be the guy to replace him. So it meant, meant a lot to me. Man, I love that story. So what's your memories of the flashlight game? Oh man! It was, it, I mean, I, I I remember getting a. I remember the guys had it where I get a tackle inside the twenty on special teams. I, I ended up getting a tackle inside the twenty. I almost ran down a ball on a uh, on a punt to tap it back in. I had maybe one catch. I had another tackle on special teams. It was kind of my breakout game down there. And then I remember winning that game with Wayne throwing. Uh, Wayne catching the pass from Curtis Martin. Curtis halfback. takes the glove off yeah. in the huddle. And throws the halfback pass to Wayne, and we end up winning. And then we get back, and then uh, I remember Al Groh handing out everybody flashlights. Uh, <laughs> at the, and, and he tells the running backs, you put cut your lights on and put it up there. And then uh, tight ends, you cut. So you say, see, we, we got a lot of flashlights, but we all together shine bright like a star. So it was kind of, kind of a good message behind it. What did Herm Edwards mean to your career? It meant everything. Yeah. Herm brought me in and gave me an honest opportunity to, to, to play. And when he came in, there wasn't nothing in this world I wouldn't do for that man. He, I, he told me, I'm going to give you a shot to play. I need you to play. And from there, it, just, it gave me confidence that he was really willing to allow me to, to, to excel in his, with his team. How did you make it look seamless that you went from – a veteran quarterback like Vinny Testaverde to a younger guy like Jan Pen Jan Pennington. Well, you have to remember when we came in, I worked with Chad every yep. day. And me and Chad would talk all the time. Chad would even talk to me even when he wasn't in and getting the reps. And he would tell me what he saw and what he thought I should do. And he'd tell me to try it this way. And the great thing about me is when people are coming to me with stuff, I'm very receptive. I love learning new things, especially if it's coming from the quarterback. And we knew he was going to be the future. Yep. We just didn't know when. It came a little sooner than we all anticipated. But just talking with Chad and, and getting on the same page with him before he got in, it made things so much sweeter. And then I had to give him a little threat, too, uh, about, about me getting the ball because we was going to Jacksonville uh, the week before he got He said, start. I'm going home. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I'm going home, and I want the football. And Chad found a way to get me to rock. Um, so what kind of advice would you give to – like Zach Wilson, who's in his second year, who has these young, dynamic, electric playmakers on the outside that we talk about, whether that be Garrett Wilson or Elijah Moore. You got some older vets here. Yeah. You got the Corey Davis, who made a great reception today. You got Braxton Berrios, but uh, specifically those three guys. Well, I, I would say the, the, the trust factor is the most important thing. So when, when you're talking with these guys, get the little things. So he would tell me, he said, LC, when you get over there and you stop, I'm going to place the ball where I want you to turn, and I'm going to protect you. I'm going to get you away from the defender. So you're not looking or worried about you're going to get blown up or anything like that. And so when you know you got a guy that has your best interest at heart and is trying to protect you with the football as well as make you a better player by getting the ball in your hands so that you can make plays to help the team win, that chemistry and that trust creates something special. And once they get that going and he starts talking to them with the football, man, they're going to be hard to stop. Did it piss you off? Early on in your career, when people said, Jets really need a big guy on the outside. They don't have a true number one receiver. And I don't, my counter would always be, well, look at Laverne Sicole's stats. I, mean, I don't care how, what his height is. It sure looks like a number one to me. Well, I, I guess, you know, people have the perception of what a, a, a number one guy was back then. But in our wide receiver room, we all had faith in each other. Me, Wayne, and Santana. 
we all knew that when we stepped on the field, that other team feared us as all number ones when we came out that tunnel. You couldn't just key on one guy and say you was going to stop him and that'd be it. And then again, we had Curtis Martin. So <laughs> it really didn't matter what they did with us. You still had the game plan for him. So it gave us a lot of free space on the outside to be able to maneuver and do what we wanted to do. How much did you like working with those guys, Wayne and Santana? I loved it. Those are the, And again, you don't know what you have until you don't have it anymore. But being in the room with those three guys was like the best year of my career for us. Being able to just play, have fun, be free. It was no selfishness. We all was genuinely happy for each other after each other caught a touchdown, got a first down, and we we just we really had fun. We really enjoyed playing together. Was it hard for you signing with Washington? I and I know it sounds ridiculous, but because you're getting paid, the mo- money money talks, yeah. no doubt about that. But leaving the situation where, hey, I developed here, I have a lot of friends here, I, and you're a young guy. I wish I, I was more mature and I had seen things differently at that time. Cause I didn't have anybody to talk to or bounce things off of. I mean, you talk to your agent, your agent's going to guide you to take the money. No doubt. But when you look long term and, and, and things that – could have been if I'd have stayed here. I probably would have moved up on the list all time Jets wide receivers. If I had stayed here, I'd have had another couple opportunities to go to the playoffs uh, with this team. But they went to the playoffs the year after I left, and they felt like I was a missing piece. Um, it's just so many things. I mean, you're young, you're immature, you don't know uh, long term. You just know about what's in front of you right now. But if I had known the things I knew now, I would have never left. But it's not like. You went to Washington and didn't have success. You yeah. you were a pro bowler right yeah, away yeah, there. Yeah, I, I was good, but I, but I but I wasn't. I didn't have the same level of fun that I had when I had, when I was here. I mean, and I know it's probably hard to understand, but I truly enjoy being here. That's why I came back. I was like a straight cat. <laughs> I came back like three times. They fed me once, and I just kept coming back. <laughs> All right, so. What was your thought when you heard you were going back, but the guy you were getting traded for was Santana Moss? Well, <laughs> oh, that story. So it was just, it was it was bittersweet. You know, it's like, well, I get to go back to where I really want to be. Yeah. But I really want to be with Santana and play with him because he's another speed guy, and we was able to stretch the field together. But that's 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 the business side of it that, you know, just, just happens. You come back. I still have Wayne. Um, even even if only for a couple years. But Wayne was the guy that pretty much taught me how to be a pro. Mm-hmm. Um, took me under his wing. Uh, still love him to this day like a brother. So, we, I mean, we just a different family. He's, he's an extension of my family. And it, 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 the business side of it gets in the way sometimes. And, and it's bittersweet. But, you know, guys do what they got to do. What did you think was the team that, could have went further if you play it back in your head. When you look at back, you look back at those playoff so we appearances. Went to the, the year after we and I can't remember the exact year. I think we beat we beat the Colts. That's all one. Yep. Yeah, and then we had to go to. Hold on, no, that no, might that, be O two, isn't O2. it? Yes. O two. And then Oakland. Then, then we not then lost in Oakland. Yes. Then the next year, had I not went to Washington, right? I think that year, if I'd have stayed, we'd have won it. Yeah. I think we'd have won it. Because it was building towards it, something. We we had all the pieces in place and and I was the missing piece. I truly believe that. If I'd have stayed, we'd we'd at least played in a Super Bowl. What was your favorite moments there? Where? Washington? No, nah, New York. Is it Oh. Well, I mean the the Where most memorable were? night would be Monday Night Miracle, of course. That was super fun. People didn't even know we had won until the next day. Um, but just, just, I think the locker room was it for me. The guys in that locker room was so in tune with what it took to be a professional and what it took to play the game the right way and go out and win. And once you was a part of what they were trying to get done, they gravitated to you and brought you in like you was part of the family, which is which is great. Okay, so take me to the sideline during the Monday Night Miracle. Was there ever a time where you're like, eh, I don't know, it's not our night? Again, I was young. I didn't know no better. So all I thought was we could win this. And if you go back and look at film, you see me on the sideline, hey, guys, I think we got a shot. You see some guys looking like, you ain't looking at the scoreboard. Yeah. But I, me, I, did, I, did, I didn't know that 
we were not supposed to come back and win that football game. A lot of people had left the stands. Some people had cut their TVs off. Right. So, and I mean, I, I don't think that game ended till like super late. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. I remember I was at the breakfast place across the street getting the guys their bagels the next morning, and I was in line behind a gentleman, and he looked down at the newspaper, and he was like, they came back and won. I was like, yeah, we, we won last night. I was in Tampa at the time, and I was one of those people who fell asleep early. <laughs> and you guys were down by a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, that game was just absolutely incredible. Did you like playing against Miami? Because I felt every time LC was lining up against Miami, you knew what they were going to do. They were going to try to play man because they had confidence in their corners. corners. But to me, that meant Coles is going to go off today. I, and I had something personal against them. I remember going to uh, the Senior Bowl and asking to fill out one of their forms, and they wouldn't even let me fill it out. You know, and I was like, okay, I'll show you when I get a chance. And so every time we played the Dolphins, I just had something inside of me, just wanted to crush them. So it, it, it was just something personal for me. It might not have been personal for anybody else, but it was personal for me. How much you following the Jer uh, Jacksonville Jaguars down there? Unfortunately, more than I should because I'm, I'm there with them. But, uh, I mean, they've had a, a rough couple of years at it, but. I ain't, ain't nowhere to go but up for them, I tell you that. The reason why I ask is because obviously there's similarities and parallels because you got Trevor Lawrence goes number one in the draft and then Zach Wilson. Hey, and those guys will always be compared against each other. Well, it, Joe Douglas has done a gr great job here getting Zach help and surrounding him with talent. Uh, I can't say the same for down there, just being mm -hmm. honest. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think we're on a, um, a different path than Jacksonville are, Jacksonville is. And I think you will see a lot of that this year once they get opportunity to play and show. And you will see it in the opposite direction for Jacksonville. Yeah, opinion. from afar, I felt bad for Lawrence considering <laughs> what happened with the coaching situation yes. last year. I don't yeah. think anybody could have excelled in that spot. Well, and, and so basically, it's basically like he's a rookie all over again. Right. So you got a new staff coming in. You're having a, you know, basically learn everything, you, you answering questions about stuff really that doesn't have anything to do with him and, and that has nothing to do with f football, so to speak. And, the, I mean, your heart has to go out to the kid. Well, here, there, there is, Zach has had – he's got everything. He has a good GM. He has a good coach. Yep. He has his offense that he's been in for a little bit, so he's starting to understand it, learn it. Um, it, it, it should be fun for him now. The next two years is going to be – Really, really, a really good stepping stone for him to go in the right direction. This is a unique fan base. Why were you so connected with them and continue to be to this day? Because people were lining up asking for your autograph out there today. Well, I, I think the, 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 the city has always been about hard work, and they see guys that have a toughness to them. It's always that grit and toughness. I mean, even when you speak to them, they're just like, hey, they'll bump you here and probably won't even say excuse me. That's just that attitude. And when you go out and you display that on the football field, it, it, they can relate. You know, they, they love toughness. And, and that's what I was about, going across the middle and getting hit and getting back up and going at it again. They, they love that. So if you're willing to lay it on the line for them, they're willing to lay it on the line for you as fans. And I think that connection will always stick there. For those of us who haven't played in front of 75,000 people and haven't made that key third down conversion or caught a touchdown, what's that like when you make the play, but then the – Oncoming Russian noise. Oh, it's, you, you can't get nothing. There's nothing in life that you can get that feels that way. I mean, there's nothing like it. I mean, it's, it's crazy. People be like, man, you be I said, when you're playing, you don't hear anything. When the ball's in the air, I don't see anything but the football. Yeah. And you don't really get an opportunity to enjoy that moment until you actually are tackled, the whistle is blown, and then you can kind of you hear the noise creep in. Then you're like, Man, that feels good, and the guys are like, man, good job. You know, it's just it's just something about it that you you, you could never get, and that's that's what I missed the locker room and hearing those fans uh, scream for you on a big play. What do you think about the way receivers are getting paid around the National Football League now? Oh, now see, <laughs> now you're making me want to put my cleats back on. <laughs> I, I we saw Tyreek Hill, Devontae Adams, the list goes on a little bit now. I, I, I'm just happy it's happening. These guys des deserve every penny because. They change games. They're the reason, you know, we, we watch the, the big bombs and the big pass, or so they catch the short routes and make people miss and get down the field. And they're the entertainers. I mean, that's what it's about. The receivers are the entertainers. I mean, 
you start, it started way back in the day with, you know, uh, Billy White Shoes and mm -hmm. all them guys doing dances and all that. And then you had T.O. Tell you get your popcorn ready. Yep. So people really was ready to watch. Wide receivers are just, just fun to watch. I mean, it's just it. What has changed the most since you've retired in terms of the way offenses are attacking defenses? Just the physicality and them not being able to touch these guys as they get down the field. I just, I mean, I, you I jealous? Of course. <laughs> I could have played 20, 22 years had I not got hit. <laughs> no, but but now these guys just get to go out and then after five, you got to get your hands off of them. Um, again, you can't hit them. I think they got like a target zone. Back then, it was the, the target was your head. You know, you just, just however they can get you down, they got you down. Whether it was hit you below the knees, hit you in the head. Now it's not like that. What do you think about? What the Jets have at the outside at cornerback and the number four overall, overall selection, that's Ahmad Sauce Gardner, 6'3", 200 pounds. I watched him today. Okay. Very, very fiery and competitive. I I mean, he, he's everything you could ask for in a corner. And when Wayne was talking about it, he said, you know, he never gave up a touchdown. I was like, he did not, He did what? Yeah. He's like, he hasn't given up a touchdown. I was like, oh. I'm like, that's, that's Deion Sanders like right there. Like, that's just crazy talent. So – I'm excited to see what he's going to do. I know I, I saw something where the guy said they don't call him saw shit. They still call him a mod or something until yeah, he gets Yeah, the veterans out. are saying that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> until he gets out there and show them. I, I, after watching him, I, I think he saws. Okay, <laughs> I, I, I like that. But how would you have attacked a player like that who's so physical, he excels in man press, and he also has the speed. Like sometimes you see longer cornerbacks that are tall that don't have yeah, that, 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 the that speed. top end speed. Yeah. Well, me personally – I would create space and make him pick his feet up and try and make him cross over. That was one of the things I was really good at is get out on the line, slide and cheat back. He's a long rangey guy. Make him move. That's it. Make him pick his feet up and move. And if I can get him to do that, I was quick enough to get back inside of him or get around him to get on top of him. How much did you love being a technician? Oh, that's, that's part of the game. Everybody has talent once you get to this level. It's about finding the little things that's going to make you a little bit better to get you past those guys that's in front of you. But who helped you the most with that? A lot of that's got to come from internal, yeah. film, watching the film. Film. I watched, watched a lot of film. Um, didn't really get a lot of man-to-man -man after about my third year, <laughs> but I still watched a lot of film to figure out how I was going to line up on guys and what I could do just in case I got it. But it, it's, it's just film and just, just know how and – uh, just little things, getting my shoulder. If I can get my shoulder past him, I can get in front of him, I can cut him off. Just things that DBs don't like, I learned how to do. When you started to get that respect where you didn't get the man coverage as much, were you pissed or was it like, nah, that's just a sign of respect, I'll beat your zone anyway? I, I was, yeah. was kind of upset because <laughs> they started rolling safeties over the top and then you have this cornerback talking noise to you like he really did. I'm like, bro, you haven't done anything. You got, you got a man standing behind you helping you the entire time. You haven't done anything. You haven't stopped me. Well, you ain't got but two catches. I'm, well, you got half the team over here helping you. Of course I'm only going to have a couple catches. But what about Santana or Wayne or whoever's on the other side or Jericho that's eating you alive over there? Go yeah. over there. And you need to go help him out. <laughs> and, and, and that's hard. It's like the double-edged sword right because yeah they're giving you more attention but you as a player you want to contribute yep. you want to contribute in your contribution somebody's going to look at a stat sheet and say well you only had three four catches today yeah. they're going to be like well those guys they clean up yeah they, they combine for 13 catches <laughs> and, 150 yards yeah, and three touchdowns and that's what it's about yeah you just have to mature and be able to to to, to know that and the coaching staff has to be able to relay that message to you and talk to you, too, about it. All right, man. I really enjoyed this. Uh, can you tell us what you're up to in your family? Oh, well, my kids are moving up here to New York, so I get to be around a little bit more. Okay. Um, uh, they're starting next month, so I'm excited about that. And I'm enjoying retirement, man. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting home. I'm going to come up and try and do a little internship with the Jets next year so you can out learn a few things. And I've been in touch with, with uh, Mike Tannenbaum about uh, working with him and his new project. So I'm excited. I got a few little things, but I'm, I still like being at home uh, sitting on the couch playing Xbox. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are the games you're playing? I'm Destiny 2. Yeah? That's it. That is it. Okay, if you get an internship with the Jets, what department are you going to be in? Uh, I'll probably be in scouting. Yeah? Yeah. Can we ever get you to do some media? Of course. All right, cool. I'm with it. <laughs> <laughs> Lavernius calls. Enjoyed it. Right, thank you.